Good morning. Before we uh, do the call to worship, I want to remind you that this summer you're the choir for the choral responses. Uh, we will be doing the, respo- uh, the call to prayer, response to prayer, and response to benediction. If you don't have those memorized, the numbers are in the bulletin. You might uh, put a, a slip of paper or something in those so that we can sing them when ready. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 72, found on page 795 of your United Methodist hymnal. We will use the first response. Joe will play it, I will sing it, and then you can join me. salvation to the ends of the earth. I will give you as a light to the nation, my salvation to the ends of the earth. Give the king your justice, O God. May he judge your people with righteousness. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he live while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. I will give to you as light as the nations, my salvation to the ends of the earth. May his foes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and the isles and of the isles render him tribute. May the kings of uh, Sheba and Saba bring gifts. For he delivers the needy when they call, the poor and those who have no helper. and saves the lives of the needy. I will give to you a light of a nation, my salvation to the ends of the earth. When the water saw you, O God, when the water saw you, they were afraid. The very depths trembled. The clouds poured out water, and the skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. I will give to Our first hymn is hymn number 160, Rejoice, Ye Pure in Heart, and I will invite you to stand as you're comfortable. Thanks and sing your clear hosannas. Re- 
As we prepare for our time of prayer this morning, as is our custom, we invite anyone that has a prayer concern this morning or a joy to lift that up during this time. And there's a lot of people here, it may be intimidating, so don't feel bad if you can't lift it up at the same time, just pretend you're talking one-on-one -on -one to me. Yes? Your dad's uncle died. Thank you so much for sharing that. We'll pray for you and your whole family. Thank you. Others, in the back here, do we have a microphone today? I guess we don't. It's coming? <laughs> the speed of sound is slow this morning. That's okay. There it is, right back in the back there. Let's see a hand in the back. No? Oh, up here. All right, Bruce? <laughs> hello, hello? Yeah, you're good. Uh, last evening, I got back from uh, uh, ERT, which is... a uh, Emergency response team, it's through Methodist Church, EM4. We got back from a one-week trip uh, to, well, five-day trip, to uh, Fairmore, Oklahoma, uh, tornado. And uh, I've worked with quite a few of these, and every time, I, I just cannot imagine the devastation and how it wrecks people's lives. When I see a house knocked off its foundation, a house with maybe one or two rooms still standing, and the rest is rubble. Uh, trees, telephone poles in your yard, and it's just, uh, those folks are really hurting down there, uh, and I ask that you be with them in your prayers. Um, I got to come home to a clean house and a nice bed, and many of those folks did not. Thank you. Thank you. Others this morning? Yeah, okay. Julie over here, yeah. Have Julie over here. <laughs> you don't have to run. We're not going anywhere. It's okay. <laughs> we're, not, we're really not trying to make you run. It's okay. <laughs> Yesterday morning, I was at the grocery store. I got a phone call from Doreen Feltman. Uh, she's needing somebody to come and stay with Jerry for like an hour or two while she can go to the store. It's getting kind of critical for her right now. She can't really leave him by himself. He's been found crawling out to the street a couple of times and people have stopped and picked him up and put him back in his wheelchair. So if you have a few hours in the morning, please uh, let me know or I'll give you Doreen's number. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Anyone else this morning? Let's prepare for prayer. Gracious Lord God, we humble ourselves before you. Devastation may come to us in many ways. It comes through the strong force of a tornado which knocks us off our own foundation as well as our homes and at times takes lives. Devastation of the heart, Almighty God, as loved ones go to join you in the kingdom and we are left. We pray also for those that are suffering through infirmity and both physical and mental stress and affirmities. We ask Almighty God that you would bless this congregation as we continue to find ways to serve you and to be the church you've called us to be. 
We pray, Almighty God, for all the unspoken prayers today and all the prayers that will come, for we know that you, O oh God, will be a part of the answer, if not the whole thing. So we ask you, Almighty God, to bless us, to be with us, to hold us, to strengthen us in your most holy name. We pray together the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. loves me this I know for Today's Father's Day. Yay! So I brought you some pictures. These pictures are of my dad. And I, you can pass those around. There's one when he's in the military, and one with standing with me, and one with the baby on his lap. I feel really blessed that I had the father that I had. He taught me so many things. He taught me, um, how to change a tire. He wouldn't let me drive a car until I knew how to change a tire so that I wouldn't get stuck out on the road. He wanted to protect me. He taught me so many things and he taught me to love Jesus. That's the most important thing. Now, there are lots and different kinds of fathers. We have our, the dictionary says a, a father is a man who has a child or someone who begins something like our founding fathers, they began this company, I mean our country, <laughs> and uh, they, um, then they also said that it's uh, um, one of the leaders of something, so like the, the father of wisdom and all this, so um, I can't even read my own writing. <laughs> so um, there are real dads, there are stepdads, there are preachers, there are teachers, there are, um, here, just give them back to me, I see. You can just pass them all up here, okay? There. See, that's my dad and my mom. So um, some people, their own father isn't the one who takes care of them, but we have all kinds of other people, grandpas, and we have teachers, and we should be thankful for all having a father figure, even if it's not your own real father, okay? I mean, I was really blessed that my father figure was a really good one, and he took me to church, and he had me baptized, and all those good things. But uh, God is our heavenly father, and that's what he taught me. And we talk to our Heavenly Father by praying. 
So let's say a little prayer for Father's Day. He loves you and he wants you to love him. So let's talk to him right now. It's going to be a, an echo prayer where I say it, then you say it back to me, okay? Father, thank you for letting us be here to celebrate Father's Day. Thank you for putting people in our lives that can be like a father to us. Thank you for loving us. And in Jesus' name, we say, Amen. The Old Testament reading this morning will actually be 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13. And can be found on page 248. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him. For we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The word of God for the people of God. We think of God in a lot of different forms. And a few weeks ago on Trinity Sunday, I presented to the kids the Father, or the Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit. On Father's Day, we like to think of God as the Father. But the great King David, started out as a lowly shepherd. And he liked to think of God as someone who gets personally involved with us 
and takes care of us. The God of love, my shepherd is. shepherd is, and he that doth me feed, while he is mine, and I am his. What can I want or gently pass in both I have the best or if I stray What do you have to offer to God today? There are those tangible things that we may put in an offering plate, but we should be thankful for our places of work that make it possible for us to give that way. What about our hands and our feet, our time, our prayers? We all have gifts that we can share, and they're multiplied by God in this incredible, mysterious way that only God can do. This morning, we invite you to celebrate as we share in the offering, and regardless of what you're able to put in the plate or not put in the plate, as it comes by you this morning, be thankful that God loves you regardless. This time I invite the usher to come forward.
You may be seated as we sing our next hymn, number 203. This morning's gospel reading is Mark 4, verses 26 through 34, found on page 36. He also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. 
He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Thank you, Sam, so much. You have probably heard that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Now, what that means is that it's a matter of opinion, and that beauty can take all kinds of forms, and yet those opinions can become a corporate experience or a cultural experience, which can make it challenging. In our society, we actually pay people to share their opinions. They're called critics. We have food critics. We have movie critics, book critics, art critics. We have critics, and they all get paid to tell us his, her, or their opinion. But we don't always agree with that opinion. And yet if that opinion is strong, it makes a difference. And the danger with opinions is when someone shares one's opinion and calls it fact. Last night I had the privilege, I was in Owensboro, Kentucky. Uh, I was at a Presbyterian church and I was one of five persons on a panel. And our topic last night was queerness and faith. Out of the five panelists, I was the only one that had not experienced severe church trauma. Because everyone else on the panel were from the LGBTQI plus community. And they shared very humbly, one after another, the reality that once they came out, they were exiled, rejected, so on and so forth. All different churches, some mainline, some Pentecostal, all across the board. And I realized as I was listening to them last night that their persecution, if you will, and their pain, their trauma, was caused by personal opinions. People with opinions, maybe the whole church in an opinion, saying what they felt in such a way that it was hurtful to these individuals. They were asked by one of the people in the, in the audience last night, what would it have been like had you been able to come out, be yourself, live your life in a church or faith community that was supportive? And they said to a letter, well, it would have been quite different. It would have been very different. And my life would have not been so hard. As we think about opinions, United Methodist Church just went through general conference and, and gave opinions and has removed what we refer to as the harmful language and the discipline. I don't expect everybody to agree with that, but that's what the general conference has decided. And so each church is now at a point of what are they going to do? I commend this congregation. This congregation did not disaffiliate the moment that they heard that this discussion was happening. I commend you for that. And the challenge becomes for every congregation, this one included, what next? How do we let, know, let people know that we really are inclusive? Is it just by our language? Are we willing to take the next step? And there are many. And that's not what the sermon's about today, but I want to point out that opinions can hurt and opinions said as fact or as theology can hurt even more deeply. As United Methodists, we are taught not, not just to take something at face value. And whenever I preach, I say, don't believe it because I said it. Believe it because you find it to be true. And how do you find it to be true? Well, John Wesley gave us this wonderful opportunity called the quadrilateral. Scripture, reason, tradition, and experience. Any decision that we make Anything that we're working on, our beliefs, whether we're deconstructing or reconstructing our faith, we are to use those four pieces. And it's called a quadrilateral because they're all equal. The tradition should not trump scripture. Scripture should not trump reason. Experience should not trump any of them. They're all important. And when we look at any experience holistically, it makes a huge difference. A really big difference. So we have two scriptures again today. And as I like to do, let's put them in context, shall we? 
We first start out with 1 Samuel, and this is just a great passage, but I want to put it where it is nestled in here. And it actually starts out with Israel's first king, who is Saul, kings, and then King Saul's major mistake, and then Samuel, the prophet's leadership, and then after his leadership, David, and David is placed in, in Saul's service, which is really ironic, which we'll find out here. And then after that, we have the story of Goliath. In Mark's gospel today, in chapter 4, verse 26, we have parables of the kingdom of God. Now, that's really important. It says kingdom of God in these parables, not kingdom of heaven. There are both of those within the scriptures, but it does make a difference. So he has parables about the kingdom of God. Uh, the ones that we're not reading this morning that are up, uh, at the beginning of this passage is the parable of the sower. There's a parable of the lampstand. Then we come to this passage today, the, the parable of the growing seeds. And then we have the other ones, the mustard seed. And then following that experience, there's the calming of the sea. The next story is Jesus calming the sea in the storm. As the disciples are freaking out in the water and say, doesn't he care? So we put those in context, and then we discuss two things today, leadership and kingdom. What are our thoughts on leadership? Is it just a matter of opinion? Are leaders born to be leaders, or are they made? I tend to be of the opinion that leaders are made, not manufactured. But leaders come to be leaders through experiences of their life, through what they're taught, their ability to be a leader in whatever context that is. Not every leader is an extrovert. Matter of fact, so many pastors are introverts. So that's not what it's about. But I believe that the environment, the people, the family, so many things allow us to be leaders. Because you realize a leader is no good if nobody's following. It's a pretty lousy leader, isn't it? We have a lot of people that say, I'm a leader. Where are your followers? They're gone. I don't have any. I'm a self-proclaimed leader. Okay. Well, that really doesn't fit in with what leader is. I, I, I watch a lot of WNBA basketball. I like the NBA too, but I just love WNBA. And I've been watching that quite a bit. And one of the leadership tools that they're providing to young girls today is called Lean In to Girls. Lean In to Girls. And their hope is to help young girls see the leadership potential within themselves through sports or other avenues. This is vital. Many of you here today remember that when you were in school, there were no girl sports. Didn't exist. Girls were in their place, so to speak. We didn't have any avenue. My own wife, we're at that tail end there. There were no girl sports. Today, there's so many opportunities. But it's also important that we support young women. And of course, if you haven't noticed the discrepancy between the NBA first year salary <laughs> and the WNBA, woohoo! We're comparing millions to pennies. But their lean in is a way to, to get young girls involved. And then as we look at the kingdom, and in Mark's here, what, what are our thoughts on the kingdom? And I want us to realize that the kingdom of God can happen now. Well, let's dig into Samuel. I, I really like this passage. So King Saul is the very first king of Israel. Samuel did not want to anoint a king. And Samuel told the people, if you, you make yourselves the king and want to be like everybody else, guess what's going to happen? He's going to take your land, he's going to lord it over you, and all these different things, which can be true. Saul was told very specifically in his latest conquest, he was given very specific instructions. He did not follow those instructions to the letter. Big mistake. So God says to Samuel, we need a new king. Now, Samuel's a little frightened at this point. He knows Saul. Saul's arrogant. He's a narcissist. He's violent. And Samuel says, well, maybe somebody else will do that because I don't think he's going to be too happy. God says, I'll take care of it. He says, when you go to see Saul, tell him you're going there to offer a sacrifice. And as you offer the sacrifice, I want you to invite Jesse and his family, and I'll take it from there. That's what Samuel does. They said, why are you here? Skeptic, concern, I'm here to offer sacrifice. He does a sacrifice. Jesse comes and is there with his abundant family. Jesse has eight sons. And Samuel is to pick the next king of Israel out of those sons. So we have the parade of sons here in a moment, right? Samuel waits and he sees the first son, big, strapping, handsome young man. What's the opinion? Oh, he must be 
the leader. And God says, eh, eh. And he goes down the line all the way through all seven of them. And Samuel's just really defeated. He said, oh, is that all you got? I mean, seven's a lot of people, let's tell you. Is that all you got, he says? Oh, no, there's one more. But he's out watching the sheep. He's the youngest. I don't say it, what they really mean is he's the runt of the litter. I don't think you really want to see him. Samuel says, if I don't see him, we can't go any further. They call, they call in David, who you sang about this morning. Little shepherd boy. Oh, he was handsome enough. He's scrawny. And God says, him. Samuel's like, really? <laughs> okay. Because we find this important phrase in regards to leadership in verse 7. God looks at things not like humans do. Humans look at things and see only those things that are visible. God looks into the heart. God looks into the heart. And what God saw in David's heart proved to be true. He was a leader after God's own mind. The parables are always powerful. They, they tell us things. The assumption has been for a lot of folks for a long time that every parable is about a kingdom of heaven yet to come. I mean, if that's true, why don't we take out that phrase in our Lord's Prayer? Thy kingdom come as it will be done where? Oh, on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is telling us that the kingdom of God is possible here on earth because the kingdom of God is not designed to be perfect as we tend to view heaven. The kingdom of God is to be a place where God is welcome. Uh, God's, God's ways are prolific all across all people. All people are accepted and loved. No one is outside of that experience. The kingdom of God is possible on earth. Sometimes it's possible in faith communities. Sometimes it's possible through the relationship that a parent that's been through tragedy is able to help another parent and they feel that camaraderie. The kingdom of God is not reserved only for the afterlife. Because if we only look for the kingdom of God in the afterlife, we spend our time here while not doing what we should. And what is that? Loving others, loving God. So where does that bring us to as a leader? Leaders come in many shapes and sizes. I'm always glad about this, this scripture because it, it lets those of us that are gravitationally challenged and a little dumpy to know that we are loved as much as everybody else, right? It's not about the weightlifter. It's not about any of those things. But we do need to understand that a leader, according to God, has a heart for God. So what's that do to the eye of the beholder? Who do we listen to? That's a tough question, isn't it? Who do, whose opinions do we listen to? You say, do I listen to you this morning, Craig? Well, sure, but wait until you find it to be true, right? Discover it yourself through scripture, reason, tradition, and experience. But the one that we listen to in regards to leadership is God. God is the one that lets us know what the qualities of a leader are. And they're a person that has the heart of God, the will of God, the mental and spiritual strength of God that in time this runt of the litter takes on the giant Goliath. His brothers cowered on the sidelines with the rest of the Israel soldiers. David says, I'll take him. Why could he say that? Because in the very last verse of this passage it says, from that day forward, the anointing of the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. Man, don't mess with people when they're caught up in the Spirit of the Lord. They are ready to do things that we can't imagine. And God continues to show me over and over and over again that he really can, she really can, they really can do anything. And as far as the kingdom of heaven, you know, I do an awful lot of funerals as well, um, especially when I was in the church, of course, now that I'm retired, but I do funerals. And people always ask, where is my loved one? And I will say always with God, regardless of their theology, regardless of what they said or didn't say, regardless of how they live, I, I will always say that with God, God created us and God desires us to be back with God. I don't understand all the pieces, but I know God is big enough and great enough and powerful enough to welcome all people, even after their death. Now that makes me a heretic among some people. But the reality is, is that when 
When people are grieving and hurting, they need to know that God is merciful, loving, and full of grace. And so the kingdom of God is something both here and there, wherever there may be. Oh, I believe strongly in the afterlife. I believe it's going to be something I can't imagine. I hope it's not harps and naked little people flying around. That would be to my chagrin. I just hope they have good coffee, <laughs> good conversation, and friends and family that I can share it with. So today, I challenge you on a few levels. One, I challenge you as a congregation to think about what your next steps are as United Methodist Church. Because right now to say, I am a United Methodist, it means something like it's never meant before. It means something. And how do we convey that to others? We often expect others always to come here. Last night, one of the young women that was speaking, she said, well, my partner wanted to come tonight, but she just still can't work up enough energy to step in a church again after what happened to her. Think about that. Couldn't get enough energy, strength, or anything to even walk into church. So one of the challenges is not trying to get everybody in here, but for us to be out there where people are and find ways to relate God's love to them. The second challenge is in regard to leadership. Don't fall for the stereotypic ways that people may be leaders. There are some very significant leaders out there that are introverts that may not speak uh, well, but that are able to meet people's needs in a different way. Think of chaplains. Think of those that work in hospice, powerful leaders of families through that journey of grief. And they may not preach a word. And then finally, I, I just challenge you, or I want you to look in the scriptures for yourself, reason, tradition, and scripture, in regards to the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is bigger than our limited imaginations. And I have seen the kingdom of God on earth. Oh, not universally but I've seen glimpses of communities that were living out that unconditional love. Now, that's a lot. But this is my last Sunday. We've got to get it all in. <laughs> but truth be told, we look to Samuel and we look to the Gospel of Mark to remind us that God is constantly helping us to grow. And just like the parable of the growing seeds, let's remember something. If you're feeling today, as, as you hear these things, like, oh, I don't know what I can do, let me give you some, let me give you some help. It simply says a farmer throws the seed, puts the seed out there. He goes to sleep and he wakes up. He goes to sleep and he wakes up. And then one day, the sprouts come. The farmer doesn't know why. Now we're talking, you know, for the parable, back in the middle of the crack. The farmer doesn't know why. But they continue to grow and continue to grow until they get to that point where the stalk and then the ear, they get so big it's time to harvest. And the farmer harvests those, though he did nothing else but sow the seeds. Sowing the seeds is simple by telling someone hello and welcoming, sharing an act of kindness, sending a card, or going to places that we wouldn't normally go to show with our presence that we're not afraid. May God bless you on your continued wonderful journey of faith, and I look forward to see what Old North United Methodist Church will do. Praise be to God. I invite you now to stand as we sing our closing hymn. It's really good, the hymn of promise. That is the right one, isn't it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Natalie Sleeth was a United Methodist minister's wife and penned these words that reminds us that there isn't growth until there's change. A hymn of promise. Hymn number 707. And again, stand as you're comfortable. In the pulp there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter there's a spring that waits to be unrevealed until its season. Something God alone can see. 
There's a song in every silence seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery. Revealed until it sees that something God alone can see. In our end is our beginning, in our time, infinity. In our doubt there is believing, in our life, eternity, in our death, our resurrection, at and last a victory, unrevealed until it sees that something only God can see. And now as we go forth from this place, out into the world, may it be with the strength, the anointing of God's Spirit, with God's heart and the knowledge that God is with us always. And we give thanks. Praise be to God. Amen.